Welcome back to another episode of the Priceless Podcast with your host, Taylor Price. Today, I have Mark Setlock, Seth Godwin, and Russ Fagan. Guys, how are you doing? I know you traveled from all around the country to be here today. Doing great. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Wouldn't miss this trip for the world. Incredible. Yes. Thank you for having me. Where did you guys all fly in from? Oh, I came from sunny Philadelphia. Okay. East, East Coast? Humid Pensacola, Florida. East Coast. Midwest. And is that CST or? Eastern. Eastern as well, too. So what time do you guys wake up this morning? I got up at 8.30. The alarm is set for 8 a.m. every morning. Ooh. Yeah, 8 a.m. So it's like 11 Eastern time. Super. It didn't feel injury. like we slept in. We were up pretty late last that night. That is true. That's Whenever true. creators get together, I feel like we just don't know how to stop no talking. No sleep. Sleep is for the week. Yeah. <laughs> it's not even like we're doing anything. Like it's just absolute con- like fantastic conversations. Yes. All the time. Yeah. So get it. Get into it. I'm gonna bounce it back to you. How did you become a creator on TikTok? That's a great story. I'm. I have to tell the story. I don't know if I've ever told the story on a podcast. So, I met Taylor before I was actually on TikTok. I worked for a startup company in my job, started doing like senior analysis, right? We're all in the finance space, but my company had no marketing team and they were ready to launch the app. And I was like, all right, guys, I think I'm going to be the marketing director now because we need someone to start this campaign. We need someone to start our socials. We are just not prepared to launch a fintech app. So I started doing create a reach out. We started creating social media um, to help with retention because the app was initially meant to just help layman's uh, novice investors understand how to invest from a qualitative perspective as opposed to just giving them financial ratios telling you what it means you know so we added the social media and i started meeting with creators i met with taylor me. <laughs> i met with taylor she was interested in the company so we got to work together really closely and it was literally you i was yeah. like yeah i think i'm going to start making tiktoks for the company when we launch you know like everyone goes viral like that Especially this was like June 2020. Mm-hmm. So everyone was going viral at scene. And she was like, you should probably start now. Yeah. Like it might seem like you're going to go viral, but there's nothing to lose. Mm-hmm. So I remember I literally started making TikToks the next day under their handle, under the company's yeah, handle. Yeah. And then um, what, like a month passes and I end up splitting ties with this company. Which Russ is... got huge. <laughs> <laughs> no. So, so I split ties with this company because I had so many followers, all 1,000 of my followers. But no, it lit a fire under my ass. I felt betrayed by friends. And the only thing I had to my name was this TikTok account. And I had Taylor and I had Austin and I had friends like that. I had Pari Bofna and Adi Adara. And Through they added, the creator outreach. Yeah, because they, I built my own backbone by just becoming friends with these people. You know, not treating them like business partners, treating them like... The, the 18 to 22 year olds that we all are. Yeah, yeah. And 20, 28, right? <laughs> but, but yeah, I got yeah. old, no big deal. Long story short, they, they allowed me into kind of a creator community. They helped me. They like kept me going and were supportive. And over a year later now, and I have uh, increased my following by 115 thousand yes and now you're here you're in the big spotlights and the big cameras Seth how about you how did you get started um I got started strictly out of pettiness wow Uh, like oh this platform is that the millennial in you a little bit are none of you millennials no No. Gen Z baby oh my god I am old Um, (laughs) no I worked at the largest credit union in the world um and this was also at the height of the pandemic I was getting really angry with my job because I was working at home. I didn't have an outlet. Mm -hmm. um, And I was getting the same questions over and over and over again about purchasing a car. I worked Mm -hmm. in the loans department. I processed this stuff. That's what I did. Um, So I decided to hop on TikTok just to try to alleviate, like, completely out of pettiness and self-interest, try to alleviate a little bit of my job (laughs) and also help people buy a car Mm -hmm. because nobody knows how. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, that's another thing that's not taught in school, which we'll get into, but yeah. Yeah, so like four videos in, I reached 10,000 followers. This is less than a weekend. Um, Wow. And my fourth video got 100,000 views overnight. I was like, yo, this I'm onto something. Mm -hmm. Um, Eighth video in got a million views and... Like, I made 10 parts to the initial car buying series, and then people were like, how can I fix my credit? How do I budge? And I was like, hey, I know, I know about this stuff, because, like, mm-hmm. I ruined myself financially a few years ago, taught myself, and 
And um, what better than to have the experience exactly. if somebody's asking the questions? Yeah. Exactly. When did you start making TikToks? I started making TikToks on July second of twenty twenty. Mm. So right around the so time. So you guys were around the same time. Yeah, I started in September officially. I want to say, but yeah, it, it was around the time where videos like that were cutting it. You know, yeah. Yeah. we're in such a different space now. Yeah, really. And how about you? Yeah. So I've been on like the social media game for eight years now. I've been making videos for eight years. Shit, started, I did not know that. <laughs> yeah. So I had um. Like two other YouTube channels that I've been making videos for for so long. I have four other failed TikTok accounts. Um, I tried streaming on Twitch. I've been on this for a while. It's always been like yeah. a dream to uh, make this reality in a career. But give context. How old are you? I'm 19 right now. Okay. So I started so, when I was like 11. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Wow. Started <laughs> no big deal. Yeah, <laughs> Gaming YouTube <laughs> channels, outdoor YouTube channels, all this stuff. Uh, but yeah. with my finance unfolded, the one that I work on now and have, I've got the most success from. It started off uh, kind of like a New Year's resolution almost. So starting, leading up to this point, I had like four failed TikTok accounts. I was getting really frustrated. And the reason these weren't working is because I wasn't passionate about these things. I was going into it trying to like make it as a creator, you know, rather than doing it because I actually liked the content I was making. And who was the, just out of curiosity, like who was the inspiration or the creator that like led you to want to be a creator? Because I know now in schools, like, People don't really want to become doctors anymore and stuff. They want to become YouTubers, YouTubers, TikTokers, you know, creators. Yeah, I don't know. I grew up watching Faze, like those guys. Okay. Um, and honestly, just the titans of YouTube. Mm -hmm. uh, like years ago, that, that dude perfect, those type of people. Yeah. What, I, what I grew up on. Um, but yeah, my most recent channel, I started it basically January 1st and I went super hard. So I started posting 10 TikToks every day. <laughs> For like... Of 2021? Yep. Okay. So I did that for like a week. And then at the end of the week, I think I had like a couple thousand followers. And this is this is it. I've never gotten more than a thousand followers on a platform. Um, this is what I meant to be. And I doubled down. Uh, I posted eight TikToks every day for the rest of the month, that first month. The consistency. Yep. yep. And then hey, following... that's what I did. Yeah. Yeah. And then following that, up until I think May or June, I continued to post four TikToks every day and live stream for four hours every day. Damn, and you're live streaming now, like an hour every day, right? Yeah, so That's crazy. still post once a day and live stream for an hour every day. Wow. He has a great thesis behind it. And, yeah, and why, why you, is that? So last night when we were up until ungodly hours, <laughs> we were mainly discussing how important live streaming is to TikTok Connecting. specifically. Mm -hmm. And I want you to explain why, but you basically convinced our entire Airbnb, which is six different guys that are on the space, to all start live streaming. Yeah, there's, I see a lot of value in live streams. So... Um, first off is there's few ways that you can get such an in-depth connection with your audience on TikTok. As you guys probably know, a couple second clips, not long form content, it's hard to develop that relationship. So people can come on my live streams every single day. They count on me after school. They hop on my live. They can directly talk with me. I answer all their questions. Is it the same time every day? Yeah, I try to okay. be. Yeah. Except unless I'm on vacation. Yeah, like yeah. That. Um, and yeah, so that's the big thing. It builds a huge bond. And also vulnerability, I think, is really important in social media. Mm -hmm. So on my live streams, I talk about like my personal life, what's going on. And people like that, like to see that I'm a real person, wow. I'm a teenager, um, just like them. The rela relatability is huge there. Is this where your past of like wanting to do Twitch streaming and stuff kind of comes into play? It's all, all full circle. Yeah. Everything I've learned <laughs> is led up to this point. So I, I have no regrets that these channels have failed because I think they're necessary to get to me to the point where mm -hmm. I am today. But you've used so many psychological tactics. Like when you sit in your car with LEDs behind, you have a Snapchat that's specific for notifying live streams because you've been able to figure out like with anything on TikTok, the notifications are pretty bad yeah. and they don't get pushed yeah. out to your entire following. So you've taken it upon yourself. I mean, there's hours of talking that we did last night. We can't go into all of it, but he's finding a way to build a loyal following that's allowing him to kind of pivot into anything you want to do, it seems. Or at least that's what a lot of us are seeking these days is, is like, yeah, you know, we love making finance videos. We love making any kind of videos that are going to help people, but we have personalities. And like, that's the that's why you're doing this podcast is so Long form, people, can, yeah, people can see who we are. And that's what this live streaming is, is like, I want my following to enjoy me, you know, know who Russ is, not just know that I can talk to you about stock information. You know, mm -hmm. of course I can do that, but. Mm -hmm. I want to get into, okay, we're all in the like, personal finance field, I feel like everybody has their own sub niche. And I talked about this with creators before, how especially like going into a content house, like we're all personal finance, but like you talk about more about stocks and investing and that kind of thing. And each of us have our own kind of little vertical. How did you 
get the interest within the space because it's not taught in school, or at least it wasn't taught in mine. Yeah, I'll go first. Yeah. So I think mine was pretty fluid because I worked for that company that was dealing with mm-hmm. the stock market already. So it started off, I was doing like morning briefings where I would bring up like three points and talk about them, but I was barely able to fit that into a minute and that just doesn't convert well. So I, what I turned it into was I really married what I was already doing with the idea of what that app was doing, which is how can I take financial news, which is incredibly important and very full circle. It deals with many different industries and many different like politics, government, whatever. How can I take that high level news and translate it into something that's incredibly digestible for the layman's person? So right now what I'm doing is I'm doing the classic POV where it's mm-hmm. like, how can I turn this piece of news into a story from one person to the other? And how can I explain to them how that affects a stock in a specific sector or specific industry or the stock market as a whole with what's going on right now with like the most recent pullback? So that's that's kind of my thing. And I'm, I'm a finance major and I'm business analytics and I do love yeah, investing. That was more of that question, right? So I didn't get the financial education in like high school or middle school or like elementary school and like talking about stocks. So I've heard like the term like stocks and stuff for quite a long time, but like it wasn't until I took initiative myself and it started to kind of, you know, Graham Stephan was like yeah. the one who was like, oh, okay, this is like pretty fucking sick. So like how, how did that manifest into you? Like, did you, were you uh, recommended to become a finance major? Like, did you always have an interest? Was it something in your family or? So it's actually Ben, who you know. Uh, he talked me into it. I was inspired by him. So I'm Jewish. He's Jewish. And I used my bar mitzvah money when I was 13 to get a new phone and a new computer. And he started investing and like not just putting into the S&P. Like he noticed that Target was improving in 2013 and he bought Target, which now has like seven Target. different. <laughs> Target. So that he fascinated me. He was able to turn his bar mitzvah money into something that was like substantial by coming into college, like by the time he came into college. Wow. And that really inspired me to start investing. And then it was just like you know that. full speed ahead. And Seth? Mine was pretty organic too. Um, I ruined myself financially in my early 20s because I didn't know what I was doing. Can you uh, talk a little bit more about like ruined if you're if you're comfortable? Like, yeah, what is that? sure. Um, so I was in management at Walmart mm-hmm. um, and I was, I was getting paid decently um, and I was just racking up credit card debt because um, I, I didn't know how to properly use anything. Mm-hmm. I wasn't taught properly like we talked about yeah, here. Yeah. Um, And then I got fired. I had nothing. You know, I didn't have any savings. Um, I had all this credit card debt. I had a car loan. I had a debt consolidation loan. Like, everything came crumbling Mm -hmm. down. Um, So my my motivation came from, like, knowing that there are a lot of other people that are in my shoes. So I have this avatar of myself. Like, I make videos for my younger self. Yeah. (laughs) Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, and I feel like that goes back to what Mark was saying about, like, the vulnerability. It's definitely, like, seen within videos, like, how passionate you all are about the space. So that's super fascinating. And, Mark, how about you? Yeah, so I mentioned this a little bit at dinner yesterday. I have have an unconventional way I got into investing. (laughs) So starting my freshman year of high school, uh, me and my friends all convinced um, our parents to allow us to get GTA. We got some bundle pack with it. It came, like, a million dollars in game currency. (laughs) And, uh, For some reason, I don't feel like Gen Z. I feel like a millennial, like next to you. You know. Yeah, like, that is that's a like funny perspective. Isn't it weird? Like we have like such a significant like cutoff. I don't know. Do you feel that way? You were in, we're closer in age. Yeah, I mean, I'm even older than you, to be honest. But yeah. I, I oh. kind of bounce back and forth. <laughs> yeah, I guess. I bounce back and forth. I, I, I it depends who we sit next to. Like Seth mm-hmm. brings us such like veteran knowledge mm-hmm. and then I'm like maybe I'm like, I am a Gen Z. <laughs> yeah. For sure. But yeah, okay. So me you're, you're, it's freshman year, me and my friends just got GTA and we have like a million dollars in game currency to start off with. And all my friends are buying the cars, the apartments, uh and they're flexing on me. And um <laughs> my freshman self decided to buy the businesses. I heard these businesses make you money or something. So I was buying these businesses and I realized that these businesses make me more money. And then I can buy more businesses with these and then get more cars and way more apartments than um, my friends could in the game. So then this transitioned into um, me hearing the term passive income in the game. And I'm like, all right, so I use YouTube. I like YouTube. Why don't I go to YouTube, look up how to make passive income to get better at GTA? And then I stumbled upon Dave Ramsey, Graham Stephan. And by looking up something to try to get better in the game itself, <laughs> I stumbled upon real life passive income, got into real estate stocks, and the rest is history. Video games aren't all that bad. Exactly. <laughs> I, think, I think what I love of from your story that you didn't include is that the first stock you invested in was Activision, which is a great stock. And, and, you know, my thesis 
and many long-term investors and invest in what you know, invest in what you like, and you that love goes video to show. games. Yeah. For the record, Activision is a great has had a great few years, and I'm sure you've you've gotten a good return on that investment. Exactly, and also like the thing I the thing I think is most important for beginner investors is not. I mean, everyone wants to make money, but doing it because you like it and you enjoy the process. So. Um, I always suggest invest in something that you believe in, something that you actually keep up to date and you wouldn't mind right. reading up on it. Exactly. In me as a 10th grader, I knew the development cycle for or for Call of Duty. Exactly. Because Every I knew November. Which, yep. <laughs> so I knew uh, which developers were better than the others. And I was like, hey, this one, this game wasn't, this, this developer wasn't it. So I'm going to buy now and then wait till the good developer comes up and hopefully they'll do well. And yeah, they had like three. It would, they would rotate yep. for Call of Duty. No, exactly. Sure. I couldn't agree more. It, when you're trying to invest only to make money, you are investing on emotion. You aren't reading in anything because you're not interested in the company and you're not confident. And when you're not confident in a company, you see what happened in the market in the last month, which was a crazy pullback because yeah. of Omicron. And when you're not confident in those stocks, you don't know what to do. It's like, oh my gosh, should I sell them? Everyone's selling it. But when, when you're able to read and you're able to understand because you like what you're doing, you don't need to overthink it. You can understand, okay, we're in a crazy space right now. Three years from now, Activision's still going to be making Call of Duty, and we're all going to be very happy people. And still be playing video games. And still be playing everywhere, yeah. <laughs> um, so getting more into the creator side of things, I know personally from my experience, like the dwindling down from posting like eight to ten TikToks a day to like three to four to then one daily um, can be quite like mentally fatiguing in that like you're not necessarily like throwing as much as you can out there to get more visibility but like how, how do you guys approach your posting situation and do you feel as though like if you try to take a vac vacation do you um do you stop posting are you scared like is there this always like dwindling like i'm not i'm not gonna be there people aren't gonna remember me anymore kind of thing yeah that's a yeah. great point um like you said, now kids growing up, social media is the dream job. And it mm -hmm. is my dream job. I love what I do every day. And you're doing it. Yeah, I'm incredibly blessed to have this opportunity. But it is a it is a way harder job than a lot of people think. Like you said, um, you're always on call. So no matter what, I am live streaming for an hour every day. It's my cousin's wedding the other week. And b the morning, before, like two hours before the wedding, I was live streaming. And <laughs> hey I guys, I'm going to touch you now. <laughs> Literally, I was, I was dressed up in my This whole wedding time. costs this much. You're going to get financially <laughs> saved to have a yeah. wedding. <laughs> Yeah, I should have made a video on that. Yeah, that would be good. Regarding the balance between like personal life and business is hard because you can always do more work, especially in our space. There's always more collaborations you could do, um, more platforms you can post on. So it's a really hard balance. But uh, again, it goes back to if you enjoy what you're doing, if you think you're making an impact and um, wake up every day believing what you're doing is for a bigger purpose and to help genuine people, I think... Uh, that'll keep you going and you won't get burnt out. To go off of that though, when does doing what you love become work? Because <laughs> time in the space, I see so many people doing what they love and eventually it becomes like work for them and then they burn out, so. Yeah. I really think that has so more to do with like brand deals and anything for me. Like when okay. I, I, there is, everyone has, feels pressure. I mean, most most creators feel pressure to, to like, whether because of the algorithm, like you're, how this conversation started, mm -hmm. like you're afraid, but also, you still have control. It's when you like sign a contract with a brand who then gets to have control over your creation is when things get stressful. Mm -hmm. I saw a really cool TikTok and I'm, I'm going to botch it trying to re-explain it, but I have to because I really think it's relevant. It was someone that wanted to be an actor and in modern day where acting is difficult and you can't really make money off of it unless you're incredible. And so he starts a TikTok and it's a POV and he's going back and forth through time. And, it, and, and it's like, okay, I'm acting now on TikTok. It's going great. I'm getting followers. I'm getting brand deals. I'm getting paid. I now have no say over my acting. I no longer can create what I want. What I did to get to the space where brands wanted to reach out to me because they love my work is now being suffocated by all of the technicalities and regulations around our space. So I think that's when what you love becomes work. And I'm not talking crap on any uh, brands. I think brands are the sole reason we all get to do what we do and like super grateful for them because they support the hell out of us. But that's when it becomes work is when like you have to do something if by a deadline for a person, you know? Yeah, and then having the you know, just creative direction being taken away, you can already see within your audience, like, bro, if you want a nice converting campaign, yeah. okay, well, let us speak our voice rather than try to limit what is being said. There, in. There's this <laughs> misconception, yeah. you know, there's a misconception. And I think it's because we're in such a new industry, but it's, 
It's, do you want me to make a commercial? And, and you can take that commercial with exactly what you want. It's going to be exactly how long you want. And you can repurpose it, license it, and get and pay for the rights. And go produce it where you want. Or do you want me to make a TikTok? Do you want me to do what I love to do and throw your brand in there one way or another? It's not going to be everything you want. It won't bring you all the features. It's not going to be 60 seconds of just me loving your app it's gonna it's gonna bring it up though at some point and it's gonna get way better numbers yeah well, exactly what you said is so true so i've actually moved away from brand deals kind of i only mm -hmm. i used to only do a max of usually a max of 10 or two brand deals per month mm -hmm. all right and now i don't did i even do a brand deal this month i don't know but i've moved to like an affiliate model rather because i think i can convert better when i'm not like limited to sending things to compliance this, that, the other thing. And I really don't make posts about it, but I'll talk about it in my live streams mm -hmm. and talk about products I genuinely believe in that I use myself and I think it converts a lot better. Like you said, because I have the creative freedom there. Yes. <laughs> we're, we're all talking about like how we make money as creators right now, which seems to be such a touchy subject. I feel like TikTok viewers, at least I'll speak for my own viewers, have this beef with me for making money through TikTok. They want everything to be free. They want me to spend all my time every day just creating for them without being able to profit off of it. That's how they're able to get it free though, is through when able when you're able to compensate for your own, you know, costs of living. Yeah. You like have this choice. It's it's like you guys can support me. Let's do a membership. You can get all my content and I can I can make these videos specifically for you. Or brands can support me. I have to put out a video every once in a while that you might not love. But I get to do what I love for you for free for you every single day. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah, a, it's yeah. a tough balance. Yeah, and I think people would choose, you know, wanting the free content to see you all the time instead of having to pay, like, you know, like, for example, like, boxing. Like, that's not even paid anyways nowadays, you know? It just streamed on Discord or something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, yeah. But I guess, do you, have you, is that why you don't do as many brand deals? Do you see a yeah. lot of hate? I'll get, like, comments like, you're a sellout, and it's it's crazy. So I'm curious if you guys see a similar repercussion. Yeah, so I'm super fortunate. Um, my community is really, really understanding. And it probably is because I live stream so much. They I don't call them, like, fans or followers. They're literally my friends. And yeah. anyone in my live stream hears that. They're my friends. Uh, so I usually don't get much kickback from posting brand deals, but I do see that there's a problem with posting brand deals because uh, it will decrease engagement, it hurts the account or something. So I'm, I'm very afraid of brand deals, I'm being honest. But like you said, we have to make a living at the end of the day. So um, there's a minimum threshold I have to make to live and that's why I do some brand deals. Yeah. You wanted to add on to that? There's a, there's a big disconnect between what people what people see and what they want to see. Mm. They don't, I don't, I don't know. Like, yeah. it, it was kind of, you, you both did a great job of explaining it, and I, I don't have much to add to it. Mm -hmm. There's just, like, convincing an audience that you have to do something is a lot different than, um, than just doing it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's the problem, is as a, as a viewer of any of our content, they think to themselves, he wants us to buy something else. He wants us to go somewhere and do something. And, and I actually made a video about this. I sent, I sent Taylor a video because I was like, I'm afraid to post this video. It was me yeah, like yeah, ranting yeah, about yeah, yeah. brand deals because I was so frustrated with like, yeah. with, with how my videos perform. So I made this video and I was like, you don't have to go do what we're asking you to do. You can just share the video. You can like the video, comment, just be supportive. Like, I don't need you to spend money to benefit me, but there's ways you can support as, um, as, like a, as a viewer of my content. And it's the reason I bring this whole thing up is because it seems like such an interesting space where no one ever wants to talk about it. Like yeah. no creator really feels comfortable talking about how much money they make or why they, or how they make money. I want to throw it back to like the viewer side. So we've all become creators. I know myself personally, I am not necessarily like a consumer anymore. I'm, I'm on the app, I'm posting, boom, I'm off. Mm -hmm. Like I feel like, like TikTok and these other platforms, like besides very like limited things on YouTube, but you know, which like we watch, I don't like go on there as a consumer anymore like because I'm there for like business um are you guys in the same boat as well too like do you freely go on like social media as a consumer or are you always thinking about oh this is a good trend to do like oh like how can I apply this to my own content you know the only time I consume now is to find out what I, I'm gonna make content yeah on. yeah that is so true my for you page it's totally different than when I had tiktok as a consumer now it's basically my similar content and it's just for me to get ideas or see what's trending on TikTok so I can make a morph content off of that. Mm -hmm. 
I'm a consumer. I'll yeah. be honest. Yeah. <laughs> they might not watch TikTok. I like it. I watch it before bed, but I but we've also had conversations and I've been trying to push myself away from that. You turn off every night before bed and you read. And like I've known you for a few years and I've seen you continue to grow and develop because of it. So it's something I'm working on. It's gonna yeah. be my twenty twenty one revolution is to not watch TikTok before bed and instead read. <laughs> listen, yeah, read or listen to audiobooks. Yeah, yeah. It's a tough one. There's a lot of things that like we as humans want to work on, whether it's like going on a run, meditating, drinking a lot of water. For me, it's like wanting to read. I find that as a fi- creator in the financial space, like I'm graduating college, I have to continue to learn somehow, right? How can mm-hmm. I continue to learn and help my viewers, um, if not by reading? Yeah, Twitter is that space for me. You, I don't know. you love Twitter. I, I just love reading. I am I am such a fly in the wall. I feel like there are so many intelligent people. I finally found like the community that I want to center, like surround myself with. Um, whereas like when I joined, you can see in like 2014, I was on there like high school drama bullshit. I'm like, this is the most toxic fucking app ever. <laughs> yeah. And then it was only until um, I guess this past year where I really started following the people that you could have like a good inspiration and there's the quote like if you surround yourself with the the five people you mm-hmm. want to become you start becoming that individual and through twitter i've kind of been able to like lean more heavily into let's say like web3 the, the the crypto space um more like fin twitter and all that kind of stuff do you guys have that platform well, that's a, that's a great way to look at things um mm-hmm. because i always viewed twitter and facebook as like just these horribly toxic platforms yeah. But it was because I was following horribly toxic mm-hmm. people. Mm-hmm. Um, but once you curate your entire social media around people that you want to be like or that inspire you, all of a sudden, all the toxicity just goes away. Yeah, sure. it helps when you age. I, when you're consumed, when you're in high school or college, it's hard to see past that time and space. You're consumed by your current, your present. For sure. Mm-hmm. Russ, <laughs> um, do you have that specific platform like where? you are learning from so you said that you don't really like read i learned from seeking alpha to be honest it's not a social well it is it i I would go as far to say it's a social platform because anybody can write an article it's almost like red i would say like it has this reddit-esque type feel it's like a cleaner simpler reddit where anyone can write an article on on seeking alpha and there's like a popularity page so Mm -hmm. the top 10 most popular articles will sit on the front page and i go there every day and i read just like what's going on in the markets because it's so digestible. It's put in bullet point, fo- bullet point fun. I'm not sponsored by Seeking Alpha. I just, I love their, <laughs> yeah. I love their platform. It's a great platform. So I guess that's We're going to call them up for a sponsor now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine. Yeah. How about you? Do you have a specific platform? Yeah. So YouTube. I love YouTube. I was raised on YouTube and to this day, mm-hmm. it's my main source of uh, where I'll learn things. But yeah, I also got into audiobooks a lot more. Mm. A little bit deep. What is your opinion on college? Because a lot of people in our space... I was going to bring that up. <laughs> I was going to bring that up anyway. Okay. Um, so for context, everybody, Mark is currently in college. And when we were at the content house back in September, we were having like a like a hot tub time machine moment with everybody. Where we were like, hey, um, are you guys sticking with college? And there was a few people at the time who were uh, in college. And one actually that... I will be interviewing has dropped out and seen like major success in doing so. And Mark is, I think you're, are you still contemplating that, that uphill battle? It's like a rock and a hard place kind of thing. So no, I'm taking a break in about 10 days. I'm going to be doing social media full time. Oh shit. Did you guys all know this? Yeah, you guys were like, was this talked about like previously? It's, it was a huge dilemma in FinCon in Austin was the turning point. I realized... I, Mikey I think, Taylor convinced you. Yeah, that's a great question. So for context for the viewers, um, I attend a Wall Street Target school. And the I, my dream up to this point, um, I, I'll be honest, I was a nerd all through high school. Um, very straight arrow. They're cool. Yeah, I agree. I agree. They're cool. Um, but yeah, so I was. my plan was to go into investment banking, private equity, right. work mm-hmm. on the street, you know. Um, and Mikey Taylor asked a great question. He's like, okay, so... Okay. No matter what you do, you're, you're going to make money. You can um, make money on the street. You can make money doing this. Um, but w- what impact are you going to have? What are you guys actually going to enjoy doing? And I never thought of it. Up to this point, I knew that I got to get into a good college. I got to get into a good job. This, that, the other thing. I didn't think of the quality of life. And yeah. that changed it for me because I realized I, I can get clever. I can make it work and make comparable incomes no matter what I do. But it's the impact I can have and if I'm going to enjoy what I'm doing. And ultimately, you can see I, I love social media and I'm going to be taking a gap year but yeah wow um for for the viewers as well i think it's important to know like your parents how did you approach your your family and close friends um who are affiliated with you like going to college 
it's different with everyone. <laughs> my parents are incredibly yeah. supportive, mm-hmm. and it does help that uh, I'm making a decent amount of money now, so they can see it's a proof of concept. Yeah, to say like these are my financial statements right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but a lot of a lot of friends don't understand. They mm-hmm. they think or they don't they don't see the vision. But again, opportunity won't wait for me. I do think that college will want my money, even if it's two years from now, which I have two years to come back if I want to without credits. But I don't think. TikTok, this opportunity we have, I could just stop and come back two years later and no, see it's the so fast success. moving. So yeah. well put. Yeah. So you go ahead. I think college is necessary, and it's not f- necessary. You've always loved college <laughs> because I think there's a lot more to it yeah. than the education you learn. I think yeah. there's something incredibly important for your psychology about leaving mom and dad, going and staying with friends in a dorm, seeing what it's like to live in the same room as someone, seeing what it's like to have to fend for yourself. Then having the experience of opening yourself up to a room by yourself, living in a space that's not owned with an, uh, an RA, not being in college housing, like those step-by-steps are so important in maturing and growing and just filling into your own shoes, like not having the influence of, of your family and kind of just having the influence of who you, the five people you put yourself around, you know, or you surround yourself with. The education is great for me. You know, I've definitely learned about finance. I've definitely learned about business analytics. Those are my majors. Like, yeah, I know more than I did. I learned the vocabulary of accounting. I think that's really important if you want to be in the finance or even business space because finance and accounting is the backbone of a business. Mm -hmm. There's a very solid argument to be made that, like, you don't need college. Um, It depends on you and where you are as an 18-year-old leaving high school. True. I was supposed to be the first person in my family to graduate college. Um, and I did two semesters of like, I, I hate this. Um, I was always, you know, I hated, I always hated school. I was always good at school. I never studied for anything. Always yeah. got A's and B's. Um, nice. It just was not for me. Um, and I've always been somebody who's just hit the ground running and, and figured it out. So I think it's, you know, we've all seen the statistic. College graduates get, you know, a million salary. dollars yeah. more over mm-hmm. their lifetime. Mm-hmm. Um, but that doesn't mean that you have to have it. Yeah. Building off that, um, in no way did I mean advocating against college, because I think college is an incredible opportunity. No, there needs to be some controversy. (laughs) (laughs) No, but if I didn't have this opportunity, I'd be going to college. I'd be um, doing it up to this point. But I do think, don't don't limit yourself to, like, what other people are expecting of you or the normal path. So if you have an opportunity and it it brings you a lot of happiness, chase that. Even if the money, the money doesn't matter. It'll come no matter... um, if you're passionate about it, in my opinion. When opportunity knocks, answer the door. I, I had that in a fortune cookie, I think, from P.F. Chang's, like, when <laughs> I was, like, 15 years old, and at the time I had a clear phone case, and I would look at that for years. On, you did the same thing? Have all my fortunes. I did the same exact thing when I was younger as well, too, and I used to look through those, and it would remind me, okay, just say yes, or, like, take the opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. But I do think college is a great opportunity, and most people, if, if it makes sense for you, um, and you have... The, that privilege, you should go to college. Mm -hmm. I will get philosophical for a second. So I really like what you said, which is like, I know college is going to accept my money two years from now, which is the best way to put it. So if you're 18 and you don't know what you want to do, you can go into business undecided or an exploratory program and spend that tuition. But there's a great argument to be made that maybe you should just wait a year or two, make, you know, don't give up that opportunity cost, go work, make some money while you're figuring out what you want to do. Because I think there's this misconception where, When you're going through high school, going through middle school, and you're going up the grade system, you're always parallel to others. Mm -hmm. So when you leave high school, it's like, okay, all my friends are going to college, my turn to go to college, and then I'm going to go on Wall Street, like the classic step-by-step play. But when you take a step back and you get into the space where we are all now, like we're all isolated around our friends in in our hometown. So it's like we're already doing our own thing. I don't compare myself to people anymore. Like I'm getting to the age where I'm my own person. And I think that has to do with stepping away from high school. (laughs) <laughs> exactly. So you step once you can step away from high school and realize like you're young, you're 18, like y- Gary Vee, you can work till however yeah. old you want. He didn't start his big career until he was 40. We should mm-hmm. start when he was 30 or 20. It's the whole thing is we have so much time and we're gonna have so many careers and it, it, there's no point in kind of jumping into college and losing opportunity costs just because it's the, uh, mm-hmm. the right thing to do. With that being said, talking about social media, because so many people do want to leave college as a result of wanting to become like a YouTuber or, or social media influencer, where do you think the space is heading? Um, and I'm going to niche it more down into like the metaverse. Do you think that there's a niche for like us as creators to be a part of that or influence that? Well, I'm 
metaverse. What is that? <laughs> yeah. oh, if do you think there's a space for influencers in the metaverse? Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess we'll broaden the question. Um, <laughs> uh, where do you think influencing is going? I mean, there's more and more and more people becoming influencers and content creators every single day. Mm -hmm. And we're going through the great resignation and like uh, there's a huge spike in the creator economy. Like where is this space, do you think, like heading? Yeah, I, we. it's funny. We talked about this on Ishan's podcast as mm -hmm. well, but I wanted I want to bring it up again, it, it, the idea of how marketing is changing because that's how I view it is. When you look at uh, influencer marketing, and again, let's use a fixed number. Let's say that this influencer is charging $1,000 a video and you have a $100 million marketing budget. Like you can spend $50 million on the Super Bowl commercial for 30 seconds and a lot of people are going to see your ad. A lot, way more than your demographic. Or... You can take that hundred million, divvy it up into tons and tons and tons of influencers that are taking a thousand dollar payments. A gigantic population now, <laughs> and growing, and will continue yeah. to grow. And, it's targeted and you too. and you can target, concentrate to your demographic, and you are giving careers out to so many people. So it's no longer from one big business to the other big business. It's no longer from Amazon to the newspaper, Amazon to TV networks, Amazon to Comcast. It's Amazon to hundreds of influencers that are all able to start their own career and their own dreams. So that's where I see it going, personally. It's just continuing to broaden that spectrum. That, that is a great point. And regardless of whatever does come around, there's always going to be a need for people to educate others. Mm -hmm. um, so there's always going to be a need for people like Provide us. Provide value. And Mark brought up a great point like before we started the podcast. The people who made the most money during the gold rush were not the miners. It was the people selling the shovels. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, hot take, but I, I don't, I don't think television is going to be as big in like 10, 20 years. At least me, I, up to like throughout high school, I never watched TV. I don't watch TV now at all. But like I, cable television and like the, the huge networks are like. Yeah, like cable, huge networks. Totally. Um, and, but even now I don't really watch Netflix because I want, I like, I value personal connections and I genuinely think when I'm sitting down watching Emma Chamberlain, I think she's my friend, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think influencers have a huge opportunity that is just us in the camera, you know, and uh, there's it, it limits that disconnect between a whole I don't know multi million dollar studios, all this and teams. A listers. And stuff like yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think um, in the future there's going to be way more of a push towards influencers and being able to feel like they're your friends. We like to as a human psychology, although we love to be our own self, and I'm me. This is she. You know, we're all our own person. We want to identify in groups. We want to find common ground and talk about it. So when you can find someone that you can relate to, you obsess over them. It's like, I, I agree. with Logan Paul, for example, like he, I'm, he's a huge inspiration to me and I love the way he does marketing and I think he's a genius. So yeah, I watch his podcast religiously because I want to learn from him and he does, that's the most personal way for me to get to his content. So I totally agree with that. I don't think TV is going anywhere. You can't do away with the news and you can't do away with sports. I do think like child programming is probably in some danger, some hot water right now, though. But, you know, like, I, I just talked this about in class at my university um, a few weeks ago. If you're selling a product, at least, I'm, I, I don't drink coffee, but I got Graham Stephan's coffee because I love Graham Stephan. Bankroll. And, yes, yes. <laughs> and it was good. I enjoyed it. But that's a perfect example. Like, if I just saw it, if I had no idea who he was and I just saw an ad on Instagram, I probably wouldn't buy it. But because I feel like he's my friend, even though I've never met this man in my life, <laughs> um, the connection that social media offers is unmatched. So wrapping it out to an end here, I'd like to ask all of my guests, since it's named Priceless, um, what is one priceless you know, piece of information that our viewers can learn from that you've kind of experienced or something that you live by? I'll start off with you. Oh, <laughs> wow. Okay. A lot of pressure. Yeah. Um, Set the trend. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I guess circling back to what I've discussed on this podcast, big believer and if you provide value, if you're genuinely helping people, it will come back to you. Um, so that's uh, the main thing is provide value for people, try to make a difference, and at the end of the day, enjoy what you're doing. Because if you're making $50 million a year, but you hate what you're doing, not worth it in my, mm -hmm. my opinion. Um, my biggest piece of advice is to do your own thing and don't worry about what other people are doing. Boom. Simple. Easy. I love it. <clears throat> I think what I've, my priceless, what I've been working on the last few years and what is going to turn into my priceless artifact, if you will, <laughs> is time management and Ooh, organizing your time. I love this. One. I'm taking 19 credits this term. I'm working two part-time jobs. I do TikTok. I have a premium subscription service that I employ four people with. Like, 
I have a dog that's a puppy <laughs> and, and whatever else, you know, I also like to Life. have my friends and I've been able to find time to do all of that. 19 credits, it's 19 hours a week. And then whatever else, you know, my 18 hours and my one part-time job and kids, so, so on and so forth. So if you are sitting in the audience and you have four, five, six hours of free time after school, like put your head down, grind at a young age and retire a millionaire by 25 like Mark wants to. <laughs> it's my goal, because, it's my goal. Because <laughs> you can have fun, enjoy yourself, and I promise you there's time for everything. I've learned that this, like, this year has been my year to learn that I can still find time to have fun. I can fly to LA and, like, make things happen, and I can still grind my face off and, like, do everything I need to do to capitalize on all of my opportunities. Yeah. And, like, I've been making videos, like I said, for eight years because I realized when I was a kid, I have so much free time. What am I going to do? I'm either going to spend a couple hours playing Call of Duty or shoot my shot at YouTube. And even though the odds, unfortunately, aren't in your favor when you're young, that experience is priceless. And hey, I what about Ryan's world, man? Isn't he the highest oh, yeah, true. the highest paid YouTuber like a five-year-old? That is true. <laughs> I know? just think, especially this day, like starting early is yeah. so important with anything, whether and it's the classic stuff we all have spoke, both taught and heard on TikTok, which is get a credit card, like credit, like become an authorized user, start with your Roth IRA, start investing, fail, you know, make mistakes at a young age, like so go important. try options and lose like a couple hundred dollars and be devastated so that you don't lose thousands of dollars later in life. You know, if you can start early, like compound interest, the classic, it's just mm-hmm. start young, grind, understand how much time we have in the day and, and like, don't get carried away with all of the things you can actually do in your free time. You, it's always time to enjoy yourself, you know, but mm-hmm. we're young and we should be, we should be working so we can enjoy our older lives. Out of all my friends, I think I've by far failed the most. I think failure is so important. It's oh, the yeah. best teacher. Everyone says it. it's cliche, but until you realize it is so key. But Just, you have yeah. to make your past failures and learn from them yes. to make them into your future successes. If you're just like having a failure and you're like memorializing, I am yeah. a failure. Guess you what? have to find the silver lining. If yeah. you, it, it's a rabbit hole. Like if you let fail failure overcome you, you're you're going to continue to fall deeper and deeper. You mm-hmm. have to look for the silver lining, find the learning experience, and you're going to rise above that occasion and like do better the next time. It's, it's flawless. It's a yeah. flawless experience, I feel like. It always, it's always worked for me, you know? With that, <laughs> where, where can we find you? I, I want to end on this perfect note here. Totally. You can find me on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, Invest with Russ. That's my, that's my page. If you really want to have an awesome conversation with me, I got to push my finery group. It's, it's free, totally free. Um, but that's where I talk the most about stocks. It's where I am every day. But yeah, invest with us. TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, at Seth Godwin. Yeah, same here. Uh, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, Snapchat, Pinterest. Um, <laughs> Pinterest as Everything. of today. <laughs> yeah, as of today. I just started. Because wow. talking with these incredible people, they motivate me to get onto another platform. Also, if you have any questions, feel free to Snapchat me. I, again, I try to remove the disconnect between me and my friends on social media. So any of anyone that follows me, feel free to add me on Snap and ask me whatever questions you have. And I won't charge you. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much, guys, for tuning in. I hope to see you in the next one. Thank you, Taylor. Let's go.